um, knowledge that's in our industry. And so that's um, the, the support that we're getting from Green Manitoba is something that is um, very, very um, appreciated by the council. And it's only through them and the generosity of our speakers that we are able to provide this free service. So today, uh, we have the benefit of someone that has a long history in understanding the value of soil and the importance of compost. Dr. George Lazarpovitz has had a long-standing um, career in Ag Canada, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and um, in the 20 years that the Council has been in existence, his name has come up in many, many conversations in terms of his knowledge and his work. What was a, an incredible coup was that in 2010 he was um, hired by ANL Laboratories, who you know is one of our um, leading edge program coordinators for the Compost Quality Alliance. And together with Greg Patterson, Dr. George Lazarzovitz, George, who he insists that we call him, um, has helped build a, a new division for ANL Labs, the ANL Biologicals. And so uh, without wasting any more time, I'm going to pass it over to George to do his presentation. What we'll do is that if you have any questions, we'll leave that to the end. And um, as you know, we aim to have this all completed within an hour. So thanks very much, George, for making yourself available. Well, thank you, Susan, uh, for inviting me. And hello, everybody who's listening in. I just want to tell you two things. Uh, the George Lazarevitz is uh, something my poor wife has inherited when we first got married. Uh, she went to work with this new name, and uh, she was, for the first two years, called Lots of Rabbits. So uh, you're welcome to use that acronym also. In any event, uh, I by no means am uh, well-versed in the concept of all the complexities that are involved in composting. So today I just want to tell you about how I, as somebody working in the area of soil microbiology and this concept of agroecology, can think that your product is worth a lot more than you uh, realize and how you may be able to uh, take advantage of some of the upcoming trends that are going on worldwide. So uh, the title is uh, Discovering the Value of Compost, and it's a misnomer because we really haven't discovered it. But uh, I'll give you some hints as where things are going. Okay, so. And when you actually look at all the sort of the benefits that are available, you'll find that uh, there is a lot of things that are mentioned, and I won't go through because you probably heard them, but things like soil conditioner, organic matter, slow release fertilizer, micronutrients, water nutrient holding. And the ones that I'm going to cover in a little bit more detail is this uh, concept of disease weed and nematode suppression. And the reason being is I served for the last decade on the United Nations Methyl Bromide Technical Options Committee. And this is the committee that is regulating the use of this fumigant that's been banned because of the Montreal Protocol. And farmers who have uh, been using this broad-spectrum biocide were deeply panicked as to how to find replacements for it. And compost has come up as a mechanism. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, erosion protection, again, a lot of these things you can't really put a value as you'll see. Okay, so the, the first question that we really should be uh, looking at is what does organic and microbiomass have in crop productivity? And uh, to answer this, I, I pulled out some literature published by Dan Murphy uh, in Australia, and you will see where you can download this uh, uh, whole uh, conference proceedings free of charge from the internet. I left that internet site on the presentation. But what uh, Murphy's group did was they looked at all the factors that affect wheat yield in Western Australia. And you can see that it involves factors in climate, agronomic management, and then soil, physical, chemical, and biological components. And then they measured every one of these at two uh, locations, locations uh, about 43 farms. And the locations had to do with high productivity, which they called high yielding, or what they are calling underperforming wheat yield. So what they did was they collected information from both locations and tried to analyze all of the components that could possibly explain the differences from a high yielding wheat site versus a low yielding wheat site, which could be site by site. Well, here's the statistical analysis. 
And what you see is, I kind of highlighted in yellow, that the two biggest components that explained the differences in yields are microbial biomass and this PMN, which is the potential mineralizable nitrogen. I will tell you that in the end, those two factors became the same, and I'll, I'll explain to you why. And uh, that actually, this these two components exp explain 40% of the variability that was between the high and low sites. And the reason that it did this is that it actually, that these microbial uh, organisms, this the microbial uh, products, ex have a huge reservoir of nutrients that they store. So for instance, they may store 15 to 150 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, 5 to 15 kilograms of sulfur, and 10 to 45 kilograms of phosphorus. I can go on with other components, but you have to look at soil as a living organism, and the organisms that are living in soil have nutrient value. Now, the beauty about this nutrient value, oops, uh, I'm having trouble moving my sides. Do you know why, Dan? Sir? Hello? Do I have some helpers? Hi, hi, George. Uh, Jim is looking yes. at it. Yes. Jim. Uh, we'll give a call to um, the service provider. Oh, okay. It may be back. Sorry. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. So the, the the important thing I want to mention here is these things are not prone to leaching. Okay, and you may consider these microbes as slow release nutrients now. Compost is full of these microbes, and you only release these materials after the microbes die. And so they are the true, true slow-release uh, components. And these are actually never costed into your products. Now, why is this important? Because one unit of potential mineralizable nitrogen, they calculated, gives you 140 kilograms per hectare of increase in yield, a yield increase. And that's fairly substantial over large areas. Okay, so our laboratory is looking at this as a serious component of soil health, and we actually can manage and measure the uh, mineralizable nitrogen that's available in your compost. This is not something we developed, but it was developed by Woods End. It's called the Solvita system. You can look this up on the internet. We do sell this service, and we can also provide you with kits. But it does measure now, even there's a, this is evolving, it will measure even more accurately uh, the potential mineralizable nitrogen value of a compost or an organic matter uh, product. Okay, so let's look at what factors may actually help the uptake of a compost in, in the world. Okay, so one of them, believe it or not, is saving peat bogs, and I'll show you why. And then getting rid of rock wool, which is the primary growth compounds for, for uh, greenhouses. Rock wool is uh, similar in many ways to asbestos. It is a nasty product when you handle it. Uh, reducing the use of chemical pesticide. I'll talk a little bit about it. Re uh, replacing depleted organic matter and pu putting more microorganisms in abused soils. A lot of soils with all the fertilizer being used have burned off the organic matter. Building sustainable, healthy soils. This is a big deal. Uh, the, the, the grain farmers of Ontario has listed as their number one priority. And then, of course, running out of places uh, for landfill. And then uh, there's a huge increase in the demand of organic agriculture. And all the uh, organic growers that I talk to uh, use compost. All right. Here's a paper that's uh, uh, published in the uh, Chronica Horticulturae. And it's uh, the Journal of the International Society of Horticultural Science. And this paper describes the politics uh, of peat and the pressure groups. So 35 million cubic meters of peat were used in, in 2005 in Europe. You can see the distribution of how it was used. It's really not relevant. But 
this kind of uh, use of peat, which is a, 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 a non-renewable resource, in, in essence, it took tens of thousands of years to build up these peat mobs. But you're seeing in this slide a huge amount of literature from various uh, gr groups that are environmentally uh, friendly that are actually uh, saying we must save the peat box. Uh, and so uh, what you're seeing on the right hand side though is uh, 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 this is peat amended with compost on the left side but compost by itself on the right side. And you can see that in one case the plants are doing reasonably well but growing in some, some of the uh, peat uh, or some of the uh, compost, uh, the plants don't do all that well. Now what is happening is that there is some pressure on, on uh, sort of uh, changing uh, the types of substrates that will replace uh, the rock wool. And one of the biggest ones is cocoa choir. This is the outer shells of uh, coconuts. And you can see that what it looks like, it comes in large bricks. The problem with this is it's often full of salts and you have to leach it. Then you see some, uh, what will be an interesting product if you guys ever get into this is, is a form of uh, wood fiber. It's uh, made by some sort of process that I'm not all that sure about, but it looks really interesting. And of course composted bark, that's, that should be a big, big component of production that could be very, very useful. I'll show you a little bit about uh, how this is used. And lastly, what is most often used, of course, is composted green waste. Um, now, uh, having shown you a lousy, uh, what lousy plants grow in, in compost alone, I can show you what happens uh, here in this particular slide from that same paper. And what you're seeing on the uh, left-hand side uh, is the plants growing in, uh, in just peat moss alone, an organic uh, a, a substrate that's commercially available, and on the right hand side, a 50% amended with compost, three rows of it, and you can see that if you make the right mixtures, you can get a substantial difference in plant growth. That is, would be very, very exciting to a greenhouse producer. The ultimate objective, uh, as described in this paper, is to make something that looks like this. It's a novel peat alternative. It looks like peat, it feels like peat, but it, and it has the bulk density of peat but it's really fiber produced from oversized fraction of composted material. So there's some kind of material that you can get out of this that will be worthwhile, worth the same as uh, what peat is selling for, and that will continue to go up in the future. All right, so there's a, a slide here on the value of compost, and the first, com this is published by Odd Tremorhusen, a colleague that I know, and he gives a bunch of uh, facts about how uh, compost can help in uh, environmental factors like reduced oil erosion, reduction of uh, water runoff from fields, and et cetera, et cetera. Now, it is impossible to put a real financial value of this, but certainly it could be a very important uh, advertising value when you are uh, marketing compost. Um, Fertility-wise, uh, compost has never had a large uh, value. It was as high, the biggest price I could find was about $32 per ton, and the average price, from what I understood, was between $14 and $20. But what is not taken again into consideration here is that compost is a slow-release fertilizer, and that you really should be looking at the fertility value that's not just measurable NPK that's in solution, but there's a large percentage of that NPK that's stored in the microbials. So there's some uh, environmental values, carbon, adding, adding compost to soils can reduce carbon emissions, believe it or not. And then there's some, uh, certainly some uh, disease control efficacy, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in the coming slide. But it can act as a fungicide where in some cases on turf uh, for golf courses where pesticides are almost no longer used because you have to put these uh, skull and crossbones every time you apply a pesticide. But there it could be worth about $264 average per acre of all the values I found. But I'll show you that it could be even higher than this. So the things that you should be thinking about is what I found in one of the papers is called compost a la carte. 
And this is mixing things for better fertility if you're going to sell it for that kind of market. And I found that you can add all kinds of materials to make your product a better compost. Now, I have not tested any of these, but it's, I, I listed some of the things that people are adding to it. Um, and these obviously increased sort of the value of the compost to the people buying it in such a way that they were able to pray at least a, a value added component to it. And uh, uh, many of the compost manufacturers worldwide advertise as a way of saving uh, soils that have lost all their vitality to this way. Um, what's interesting is that sometimes even small amounts of material added to it can substantially change the value of compost. And there's some examples of adding something like humates to materials that could make it more stable and adding a potassium sulfate, which was, this is a material that comes out of volcanoes. I don't know very much about it, but they claim that by adding this uh, thiosol material, actually makes uh, the nitrogen components of the compost much better in the end of the process. So again, it's something I don't know very much about it, but I'm sure you guys have good engineers that can look into this. Uh, a lot of people think that adding uh, sulfur to compost would make it more smelly by releasing a hydrogen sulfide, but it seems that it actually has exactly the opposite effect. It actually reduces the emissions of sulfur. I don't know by what process, but it's kind of interesting, and I thought it's something you should be aware of. Here's a paper that I am very intrigued about because they added a product called tryptophan, which is an amino acid. Now, this amino acid tryptophan is actually uh, uh, produced into a, a plant hormone called indoleacetic acid. And by adding small quantities of tryptophan to their uh, soils, uh, to the compost, and then putting that in soil, the organisms that are using this tryptophan made plant hormones that made plants grow better. And again, I just want to summarize that, that sometimes making this compost for a specific market can bring huge value and could make it into a unique product that your company alone can uh, have. Okay, so um, it, it's kind of stated that uh, compost today, and this is not my words, uh, compost and weight management systems are primarily focused on the increase of the turnover rate of waste streams whereas optimization of product quality receives less attention. Now, I know that this may be true globally. It's not just something, this is written by a Dutch group, but I, I know that a, a, a European group, but I know that it's, it's sort of global uh, uh, component. Uh, what these guys are suggesting is a new market for quality compost could be potting mixes for horticulture, container grown crops, and uh, to partially replace non-renewable peat, and, I already discussed that, uh, but most important, I want to stress that what we're looking for is a disease suppressive uh, product. Okay, so how can we uh, enhance this? Well, uh, enhancing soil quality and plant health through these suppressive organic amendments. Uh, so globally, we have seen a, a huge uh, improvement of plant health by adding compost. This enhancement of soil suppressiveness using organic amendment has been widely described. So it's not something new. If you put it into a Google search, you'll get 20, 30, 40 million documents. Now, what is the missing component? And this is one of the reasons I have never worked with compost, although I've done a lot of work with organic materials, is because this huge variation that you get from batch to batch and company to company about this soil disease suppressive effect. And of course, it could be that each of these compounds have a different impact on a different pathogen, but uh, we'll talk about a little bit more about that. But again, I want to stress that the variability is something we have to address. Now, I'm going to give you an example of a compost that was uh, enriched with various bacteria and fun fungi. So in this particular compost, they added this fungus aspergillus niger, which is a phosphate solubilizer. They added a, a azotobacter, it fixes nitrogen. They added a, a penicillium, which has a growth-promoting fungus, and a bacillus, that's a biological control agent. 
And I just want to say that this compost actually increased the, the health of the crop and it killed the pathogens that could be a potential uh, issue uh, in, in this protect, protect particular uh, system. Now, in our laboratory, we test for these factors all the time. So on the top right-hand corner, you're seeing our test for nitrogen fixation, uh, where you see the blue color, that bacteria is releasing ammonium, and that's indication that it's taking nitrogen from there. This plate has no nitrogen of any sort. On the, uh, on the right hand side on the top you see this is insoluble phosphorus uh, and added to this plate and you can see the clearing zones that these bacteria are releasing phosphorus. You look for things like chitin degradation because this could be a form of releasing more nutrients and so and then we also measure indoleacetic production. Uh, this is a routine analysis of all the microbes we isolate from the environment in our laboratory. But we can do this not just by uh, culturing organisms, we can do it by molecular tests this uh, top panels, you're seeing potato plants being tested for nitrogen fixation genes associated with roots and, and stems. And uh, you can see anywhere you have a dark band, it indicates that some microorganisms with nitrogen fixation capacity is present. And some plants have more than others, and we're trying to find out who these guys are. We also test individual bacteria for growth promotion, as shown in these potato plants. And then in the lower right-hand corner, well, you can see that this, these potato plants were started in, in, without any bacteria. and These were tested with bacteria present. You can see the differences in stems and leaves and roots, uh, very clear. And we're hoping that these can be used as biofertilizers. On the right-hand side, you'll see some tests with three different bacteria on the top for control of a disease that causes damping off. And here's the control. You can see little spindly plants. And you can see on the top what these biological control agents, and these are testing two commercial, one is a commercial pesticide that is used to control this disease, but you don't see this level of growth promotion in that particular situation. All right, who wants your compost? That's the big question. Who's going to buy my stuff? Okay, I work with the California strawberry growers. This is a, a, an acre of strawberries in California. It costs about twenty to thirty thousand dollars to put an acre of strawberries in California because of the high cost of land. And you can see the beautiful berries. They picked this almost for a full year. These plants are uh, available for picking all year round. And this is what happens when you fumigate a, a strawberry field, but you don't get the, what, what you want. And you can see many of the plants, in fact, almost all of them are dead or dying. And this is a $30,000 write-off. This guy's not going to get a bank loan. I can tell you that next time he goes. Because you can imagine if it costs $20,000 to produce an acre and you want to grow 100 acres, you're going to have to borrow 2 million bucks to get that going. And this is what the plants look like. This will be uh, ripped up and started again. Here's how the strawberries plantations are going. You see they made these hills, and what you see here are two pipes. And this is the irrigation pipe. These uh, hills are covered with plastic, and uh, they hope that they be fumigated sufficiently that they get very nice yield. Now, it turns out that this field is an organic field. This man uses compost, and he has he rotates his crop, and he always gets a very successful crop. This field is not fumigated. In some of our tests, we have uh, used compost as a substrate, and you will see much, much more of this use. What you're seeing here is fields with compost, and what we did was we took a large irrigation pipe. This is the uh, about a... Uh, uh, at, uh, about a foot, foot and a half wide, and this was cut in half as shown, you can barely see it down here, but it was cut in half and each half was laid so you have, you have this bowl effect, and it, that bowl was uh, filled with compost and then covered and plants were planted into the compost in these pipes. Now, just as easily, you could make hills of compost, uh, and some people, I'll show you some pictures of that. So what you see right here, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but on the right-hand side, you see how many bags of compost were used to uh, fill these hills with the pipes. And actually, it was a huge success. The, the roots of the plants were much, much better than in soil. The yields were as high. Now, it cost about $5,000 an acre to fumigate this field. So you have about a $5,000 cost equivalent if you're going to use compost. And while the compost worked great, 
what happened was after about four months, five months, it collapsed and the plant stopped growing. So they could not finish the whole year. And what I would suggest to you is what we need to make compost that are much more stable and could support a crop for one to two years. And this would have enormous value. Okay, so this is uh, the same kind of picture taken in Huelva, Spain. You can Google this uh, location from uh, over, and you'll see that it looks like a giant lake because there's 15,000 hectares of strawberries in this area, and many, many, many of them are on compost. Uh, these hills are all made out of compost, and the strawberries are grown. Actually, in some cases, the soil is covered with plastic. The compost is laid on top. And to some extent, because the industry is not providing the compost for these growers, they have to make it on their own, and I'll show you how they do that. This is taken in a place called Brazil. It's a place in Holambra, Brazil. It's a large area. I don't know how many thousand square miles it is, but it's all owned by uh, Dutch growers. And this particular Dutch grower discovered that his neighbor had pine. Uh, it was a pine uh, plantation that was used for uh, producing pulp and paper. And he was able to obtain from them all the pine needles, and he was able to compost these pine needles and use them as a substrate. And this is his whole production area. You notice that the plants are all, this is all this area is covered with plastic. And the plants are sitting on top of the plastic, and they're all in this pine needle compost. Now, it took this grower five years to figure out how to make this product. And he puts in some fertilizer as it's being composted. And he also mixes it with microbials. And here are the microbials. And in the long run, he figured out that this reduced his overall cost to his production by about 75% to 80%. And it was organic. That's, he's selling organic flowers, which are shipped back to Holland, and they're marketed over there. So uh, again, we're looking for potential replacement for rock wool as a growing substrate. The greenhouse industry wants a replacement for rock wool. Uh, they are just trying everything that they can get their hands on. And here's some uh, groups that are looking using peat bark substrates, spruce and fir bark alone, or mixed with low-grade peat. And here's how it looks like. This is kind of neat. Uh, you can see that these are bags of peat bark and compost mixed together. Here's trays of tomatoes that are being planted into it. Um, and what you're looking at is six weeks later, look at the tomato production. It is pretty fantastic. It has been found that these uh, bags of uh, bark can be used for, in some cases, for up to five years because they actually become disease suppressive. And that saves the growers a ton of money. Plus, in the end, they take up all this material and they bag it into different bags and sell it to the gardeners in their regions. So it's become a high-value product. All right, I'm going to switch a little bit to this control of plant diseases. There's, uh, I gave you, a, if you want to review the suppression of soil-borne plant diseases with compost, I gave you an article that you can download. Uh, but I just want to sort of summarize that numerous studies have shown suppressive effect of compost. It is, it is one of the best products. Compost suppresses diseases in the field, usually a smaller effect, but then in containers because it's harder to control distribution and, and incorporation. Uh, it works on, uh, on, on, on above ground plants as a top dressing with compost such as turf grass. I'll show you some photos of that. And the disease suppressive effect is directly related to the rate of application. And generally speaking, rates below 20% don't do much. So you need at least 20% uh, uh, mixtures of material incorporated into the substrate. And again, the disease suppression is variable. Even if you use the similar compost from the same processor uh, from time to time. Now, what is known is that if you sterilize the compost by heating, you will lose the efficacy. Okay, so it is now known to be a biological component because if you kill the biology, you kill the suppressive effect. Now, there are composts that have chemical and physical factors that are also involved. And this is area that I have studied, and part of the effects are really production of ammonia. And to some extent, not finishing compost to their full maturity may be another area of value because in some cases, 
the gases released off compost are actually really, really effective in killing pathogens. However, this would require an application of compost in the fall and, and then during the winter and fall and spring it would lose this phytotoxic effect that's also a fungitoxic effect. Okay? Um, here is a, a, a graph showing the disease suppressive relationship between how much compost you add and how much disease suppression. You can see it's almost linear, up to 60%. Now, people have tested compost for a complex path. So here's a paper where they tested 18 compost against seven different pathogens. And they did find that there's some kind of specificity for certain organisms and not for others, depending on what compost and organism you're testing for. I could give you pages and pages of this kind of stuff on all the different organisms that it controls. And these are all major pathogens globally uh, uh, available. But there, uh, these reviews will give you at least a half dozen pages similar to this. And I won't get into it, but it's a huge, huge diversity. You know, from avocado to basil and to tomato and eggplant. I'll show you some pictures. Now, you have to remember that the greenhouse industry is growing like crazy. Uh, greenhouses are expanding uh, exponentially. Uh, here's one in Ontario. I think the Ontario greenhouse industry may be over a billion dollars now. Uh, it's got to be very close. Here's uh, ornamentals that are being grown in the compost or substrate mixtures. Here's flowers. You can imagine uh, Valentine's Day is coming. I saw this morning that you're going to pay 75 bucks for a dozen roses. But these flowers are all destined and they're all being grown in, on, uh, in concrete floors in substrates or mixtures of substrates, and this is where your products would be highly desirable. I had an opportunity to visit uh, my favorite uh, crop, which is basil in Italy. Italy has, uh, I would say, about a third of the country devoted to basil, and they still import 25% of it from uh, outside of the country. They can't grow enough. Again, you can imagine how much it costs to, uh, as far as substrate goes into these kind of production areas. This is just open beds, these are in pots, etc. Now you can see the density of planting that grows here. All right, so how much is this costing it? Well, uh, as you may see that this is a Ferrari. And this is a Ferrari that's now being imported into California to test it on strawberry. And what this machine does, this is the back end of the machine. This is, I believe, four square meters. And you see these tongues, that these, these uh, teeth that come out? This machine boils water. It injects steam into the soil in order to kill the pathogens. Uh, and this takes eight minutes of steam injection where this platform goes down. And it costs between five dollars and $10,000 per acre. It's auto drive. This big tank is full of water. Uh, but in general, in Italy, they will spend up to $25,000 an acre to steam sterilize their soil. And I'll show you why this is. Here's a steam sterilized uh, field of basil. They put 30,000 plants per square meter. Okay, 30,000 plants per square meter. And you will get between one and a half to three euros per five plants. So do the math. We're talking about about a half a million euros per acre of production. So spending $25,000 is insignificant if you're not going to get a crop home. Here's a, 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 a greenhouse uh, production in Spain. And I saw one similar in Portugal. And you can see that this greenhouse is really being filled with compost for the production of vegetables and ornamentals or whatever they may be putting into the system. So again, these are your customers. These are the people who are going to be taking large volumes of your product. What's interesting is that currently only a very small amount of uh, industrial compost from recyclers are being taken up. And many of the farms that I had the chance to visit globally, these people have to buy their own equipment, which is not cheap, as I'm sure you know, to make their own compost. And actually, they bring in their, uh, the, they, they buy the products to make it into compost, but they know what products will give them that uh, compost that is uh, of high value to their production system. OK, I told you I would give you uh, some pictures of uh, turf. Here is turf that's, be, uh, that's being affected by a disease called dollar sprout. This is untreated but fertilized. 
with an organic uh, fertilizer. And here it is uh, treated with this organic fertilizer here. Not treated, treated. And now here's the same grass that's untreated. And here's the grass that's being treated with a compost at 10 pounds per thousand square feet. Now, 10 pounds is not a lot of product. I would think that you agree with me on that. But if you look at treating on a per 1,000 square meter basis every two weeks, you're looking at if three treatments would give you about $600 equivalences to replacing it with pesticides. Uh, so again, as if you've got a product that controls this disease, there's some really serious uh, value to it. We work with a, a greenhouse here in Leamington, Ontario. This is a cucumber production site. What you're seeing here is uh, the propagation room. This is all uh, glass wool, rock wool, that these uh, little baby plants are. And this is uh, them flooding the, uh, the soil to uh, irrigate these glass wool. And what they start seeing very early on are these plants that are dying from this disease called Pythium. And so we're working with them to test our cocoa choir. And if you guys have some good compost, they would be highly willing to test that out too. Because in the summertime, they can lose 60 to 70 percent of their production to this disease. Now this greenhouse currently is 73 acres in size under one roof. And it's being expanded to 101 acres by next production year. The Actual value, uh, for instance, in, in the switching over from, from peat to uh, compost substrates in Florida I, is the only place I could find actual values. And they claim that from, it went from $400 million uh, to down to about $250 million just by switching to compost product. So this figure suggests that farmers are, are changing from chemical farming to this more environmental responsible method. So this is also something that you should take a look at because it is coming along at a fairly fast rate. All right, new materials. Well, one of the companies that we do have a project with is Terabiogen. They're, they are creating uh, enhanced odd thermal aerobic digestion. They're using a liquid composting method that seems to produce composted material in three to five days. Now you have a water thing to take around, so that could be a, a, a problem for some, but we're learning how to distribute this water into agricultural fields uh, using uh, very precise pumps and uh, nozzles. Uh, and these, we think that these materials can become uh, really valuable in the future. And here is uh, what happens when you take a regular uh, substrate without uh, this terabogen product and with terabogen product. And this is like uh, two days after germination. But look at the differences in the vigor that you see with the plants. And this is not fertilizer because when we add fertilizer to this, this side, it makes no difference as far as what these plants look like. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit very shortly about how are we going to ever find out what is the suppressive component in compost. Because only once we find out can we make it into a really, really important product for agriculture. There's been a lots of reviews. I'll give you this one. This is an excellent review. And then here's some reviews that deal with how to test for these functions. So what you're seeing here in the center is soil quality leading to plant health. And then what you're looking here on this side is microbial functions. Here's all the tests that we can do uh, to measure these functions. Then here's the chemical and physical properties that I'm sure you guys are already doing now. And then the culture, the microbial diversity. And we're, so we're, a and L uh, uh, Laboratories is on this side, and A and L Biologicals is doing all of this and all of this. Okay, I'll show you a little bit about how we go about this, but just to show you the kind of effects that one could see. Okay, here's a plant that again this Pythium disease. Uh, this is uh, uh, peppers, and you can see that this plant is not going to make it. Here is where you put it into a steam compost. Now you can still see this dark browning of the roots. But this plant is a little bit better because it's got more nutrients from the compost. But then here's three composts that were not steam sterilized. And you can see the beautiful root systems and a much bigger and much more vigorous plants. So we know that steam sterilization eliminates this. And people are looking at, OK, how else can I find out and narrow down to this needle in this haystack is what's going on. Where here's guys that took the similar uh, 
similar to this this system. And what they did was they added a whole bunch of antibiotics to the to the substrate, and they found that the only thing that reversed the suppressive effect of the compost is an antibiotic called rifampicin. And then they were able to look at what was killed by this rifampicin that knocked out compost. And they found there was Pseudomonas enterobacter bacillus, and they're, they're looking at isolating these guys uh, in, in, in a short order. Uh, but again, this kind of test sh shows that bacteria are the major colonizers of the seed that uh, is put into these potting mixes uh, as, as, as you germinate them. Okay. So, so far, uh, the methods that have been most selected are molecular, and I'll very quickly go through this uh, just to show you the kind of tests. Okay, so what you're seeing here is uh, actually a soil from uh, north of Toronto in the Holland Marsh. This is cucumbers grown in the Holland Marsh soil, and this is cucumbers grown in the same soil. This one was treated with a company we work with. It's a fish emulsion product. It's a company out of the United States in, uh, uh, called uh, Omega Proteins. And something about their fish emulsion creates this incredible effect where you're seeing one plant out of eight germinated. And here we got all eight germinated. So we know that this is now uh, because we control this pythium disease. But when you actually go and plate out who they are, you get this kind of plate with hundreds of bacteria, which you have no idea of who. So you're, you don't know who they are. It's like trying to find where Waldo is in this picture, and if you can't find him, he's right up there. But what if Waldo wasn't in the picture, and we were still searching for it? We could be here for 100 years. Well, we went through a series of uh, working with uh, Sean Hemmingson, who is in Saskatoon, and he's developed a system for profiling complex systems. I won't get into too much detail, other than to say that what it does is, is it targets in all microorganisms and, and all organisms have a unique DNA uh, sites that are present in all cells but are different from group to group or individual to individual. And we target these for amplifications. We uh, amplify them up. We go through a series of genomic steps. And then what we end up with is, is DNA profiles that we can compare in samples. And we can say, that this sample has similar DNA profiles to that sample. The problem with this test, it costs about $500 per sample. And this was just too outrageous. That's number one. Second is it creates so much data. We get millions and millions of sequences, and it takes months and years to analyze. So it's too slow and too expensive. So we switched into another system, which uh, uses much more simple technology. This is uh, called TRFLP. I won't get into what it is, but I just tell you that what it does, it creates for us a barcode. I'm sure you're all familiar with barcodes. Everything you buy in a grocery store, whatever, has the barcode. And what we do then is we take extracts of DNA from samples, and we then say, is your barcode similar to the barcode from... So if I took two cans of Campbell's soup, I compared their barcodes, they would be similar. Uh, if I took uh, another product for Campbell's, they may have a little variance, but I could maybe tell you that was made by Campbell's. But I, if I took one from uh, Heinz, it would be completely different. I could say that Campbell's and Heinz are different as day and night. And this is the kind of things that we can do with this. Now, you get two fingerprints for each organism. You get one on the right and one on the left, and these will identify the organism itself. And what you end up with is what these are, the barcodes. That's how they look like. But what you're looking here is 20 plants where we extract, 20 corn plants we extracted the sap from and looked at the microbial profile. And you can see that they're all very similar. And here are 20 plants of corn that we extracted the roots from, uh, the root microbes. And you can see they're similar. And here's one where we extracted the soil from. And you can see the soil differs from the root, differs from the sap. Okay. Now, we may want to look for who's important, but more important, we can look at this plant and we can see, okay, the stem microbes are different from the leaf, are different from the root, from different from the what's on the soil. And then we can compare two corn plants from different locations, one that produces 150 bushels an acre versus one that produces 350, and we can compare those two, 
and you can see they're different. As the leaves are different in microorganism populations. They're different in the stem set, but they're somewhat similar on the roots associated with the root. Now we can do this with compost, and we can come up with this uh, fingerprint that would be at some point useful to identify which product is really good and which product is mediocre and which one doesn't have any effect on disease suppression whatsoever. Once you know who the organisms are, you can use another type of uh, DNA profiling, which is quantitative DNA. And what these are is this is DNA from an organism. The more you have, the earlier you detect it. And once you know the DNA, you can create a standard curve. And this red one is an unknown sample, and it will tell you exactly how many of these organisms you have in the sample. So if you're looking for a specific organism that is involved in disease suppression, you can actually quantitate it. All right, lastly, I'm going to just summarize now, and we're going to look at the risks benefit of uh, compost. And this is the big picture, folks. Uh, of 79 container experiments, okay, soil amended with greater than 20% compost, 59 showed disease suppression. Only six showed disease promotion. So you can see that the risk of getting uh, disease induced is low, that most of the cases you're going to get some protection. And this is, uh, and now, soil amended with compost, more than 15 tons, so disease suppression out of 45 out of 59 trials, and only one had increased disease. And so these abiotic factors explain control in some, but loss of suppression is following sterilization showed that the mechanism was biological. All right, here are my summary points. Uh, so suppressive compost provides an environment, now this is key, in which the plant disease is already there, that is the pathogen is present, but adding the compost prevents disease. So it's a probiotic. The disease organism is there, but you're not getting disease because something in the compost is preventing from happening. This disease suppression in compost is widespread. Disease suppression results from the activity of antagonistic microorganisms. If we start to understand compost microbiology, this is a necessary link to pathogen suppression. Okay? And lastly, harnessing disease suppression for plant disease control demands some persistence for production of a consistent product. Again, the objective here is not to be a pesticide where we kill everything, but we want to control these dynamics between a pathogen and a beneficial organism. So this is very much about what's happening in the human microbiome, where we have good organisms in our body that prevent pathogens from establishing. All right, my last one says we should focus on critical niches such as seed, root tissue, and aggregate services for these biological suppressors. We need to identify the compost microbiome as well as the plant micro microbiome, these organisms that are interacting, to understand how they, uh, what leads to suppressiveness. Most of the work that's being done are done by individuals, but we need a systems biology approach to understand these complex dynamic situations uh, that affect communities. And lastly, we need these bioassays that I showed you, these plant bioassays and the molecular bioassays that predict the capacity of an individual compost to suppress a plant pathogen or group of pathogens. These assays are needed for quality control and for commercial utilization of suppressive compost. Just to let you know that the first international symposium on organic matter management and compost used in horticulture what occurred in 2000, uh, 2011 in, per, in, in Adelaide, South Australia. The book that came out of this compost is just going, is maybe already released. This is again one of this International Society of Horticulture books that are published. What is interesting is that this is a really lousy picture, I apologize, but you can see that one of these fields where a compost uh, pile has been uh, produced and is covered with plastic for planting the crops in. 40% of France's strawberries are produced like this. Greg asked me to put this in to remind you that one size does not fit all. This is not Greg. Uh, Greg Patterson, the CEO of the company, he, he just has a friend that looks like this. And lastly, I want to just mention to you guys that the next green revolution will emerge from underground. So 
paying attention to soil health by using your products will be a key component in this. So thank you very much and I'll entertain any questions. So thank you very much, George. We very much appreciate your insight and we're very grateful that you're part of the team of the Compost Quality Alliance through our partnership with ANL Laboratories. If, if anyone has any questions, we have a couple of minutes. Um, and also just to let you know that George's presentation will be put up on our website. Um, Bell Canada is having a little problem right now, but if we aren't able to get it oh, out that what on our website, uh, we'll get that over to you in, individually. And again, this uh, whole uh, initiative has been made possible through the members of the Compost Council of Canada and very importantly, Green Manitoba, who makes it all possible. So if anyone has any questions, we have a few minutes. So um, right now I'm not seeing any questions. Um, uh, George is going to be helping us uh, as we move the whole initiative of the Compost Quality Alliance forward where our objective as a council is to have every compost facility involved in the CQA program. And as it evolves, it'll get more and more refined. Uh, but the first step is to make sure that all of the members of the Compost Council, all our facilities are involved in the program and with the leadership of, of uh, Greg and Ian and George at ANL Labs, that's, uh, that program is going to be the mainstay of our long-term existence as a very viable industry. Um, so George, I, I think that you um, basically are not going to get any questions. Uh, okay. So you are going to get great thanks from us and you uh, have put, you've, you've put so much time into this. Thank you very much and uh, we look forward to Visiting you at our regional workshop, the Ontario Regional Workshop uh, will be in London, so there will be a visit to ANL Labs. And just to let everyone know, our next uh, webinar is on Wednesday, March the uh, 5th, and uh, Sophie Typher from Receipt Quebec will be talking about the initiatives in Quebec and how uh, organics recycling will be moving forward in Quebec. So you're all welcome. Again, thanks to Green Manitoba and the Compost Council of Canada. George, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And just to let you know, if anybody has some specific questions, my email is on the presentation. You can get it from there. Wonderful. Or you can Google my name. Thank you. Have a good rest of the day. Thank all you. All right. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye. -bye. Bye.